Hi, y'all. Welcome to the final design lecture series event for 2022. We have made it this far. Um, I am really excited to see so many faces here, and I know there's a lot of people tun tuning in online. We had a lot of alumni, recent alumni, and some folks we don't know, and some folks that we met during the pandemic time when we were remote only. So thanks to you guys, too, for coming, and hi. Um, we are normally run these events about three or four times a semester, and I'm excited to get back to that schedule soon. Um, the whole goal with the design lecture series is to break ex find in people who are breaking expectations of what design can be and do, bringing them in to talk about their work and what gets them excited, um, speak to all sides of their creative personality if they want to do that, and then have a discussion with you guys afterwards. So um, we are very excited to welcome um, our guests today. Um, but I want to give a couple of thank yous before we get started. I want to thank Lainey uh, for the design of our beautiful posters. Thank you, Lainey. Ooh, I like applause. And uh, thanks to Flo for uh, setting up with us and our fabulous folks in the tech booth for their help, both online and in person. The mics sound fabulous and velvety, so thank you for that. Um, and thanks to Katja, who is our instructor for uh, Typography One and an old friend and colleague of mine and a friend and colleague of Olivia's um, who introduced us and I'm really excited to be able to um, use some of our networks to meet new people like this. So always open to other ideas of who we can bring in. Um, for the folks who are attending virtually, we can have you type questions into the chat and Flo and I are gonna be moderating the chat and we'll be your voice in the room. So if you decide that you wanna ask questions, type them in um, when we get to that part of it and we'll try to get to as many as we can. For folks in the room, I'll probably run around like with a microphone in personal space and hand it to you so that um, our folks online can hear and so the room can hear you too. Um, if anything goes wrong with that, we'll wing it. But, um, but yeah, I wanna make sure that folks in both spaces can hear. Um, and the mic makes you sound better anyway, so it's not too scary if you have to ask on mic. Um, for folks attending online, you just need to be signed in to YouTube so that you're not asking anonymously in order to comment. And you do that, I think it takes like five minutes for it to show up. So, all right. So with us tonight is Olivia, Olivia Jade Curry. Olivia is um, otherwise known as OJ, a writer, a multidisciplinary creative, and a healer using transformative language arts, trademarked, and creativity as a vessel for micro and macro justice and she makes it all look good because life is too short not to. Olivia says, I care about people creating opportunities of visibility and transcendence for black and brown folks and centering joy, worthy cause. Um, aside from OJ's personal creative pursuits, she's also currently um, in her career life doing storytelling, creative strategy, and concepting for the Global Purpose team at Nike, and she'll introduce you a little bit more to that work. Um, she's also worked with Nike as a senior brand manager with Valiant Labs, a business incubator that creates businesses to serve underrepresented groups and promote sustainability. So I'm really excited to see how these worlds connect for OJ and uh, just excited to see the things that you're thinking about. Um, I had a design student um, tell me earlier today that they are not a huge fan of their writing classes, but the writers who come in and do these design lectures are their favorite, most inspiring speakers. Um, so no pressure, right? <laughs> um, but I love it too, and I think those worlds intersect in really beautiful ways. So without further ado, here's OJ. 
Thanks, y'all. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, so I'm going to try not to sweat from all the pressure that I feel like I'm under right now. And hopefully my words are a little bit better than my uh, deck making skills. So, um, but yeah, hi, I'm um, Olivia Jade Corey. And uh, my friend Katya uh, approached me when we were at work one day and asked me to speak to students about my journey as a writer. And I was like, um, Katya, but this is for a design school. Like, how do I even qualify? What the, you know, like, what the fuck do I talk about? And she was kind enough to communicate how much she has, you know, seen me with my words. And she said, you know, just talk about your personal journey with writing and how it brought you here. Um, so here, meaning the Pacific Northwest, meaning Nike, meaning this moment where I'm nervously talking to you all. Um, so I thought about it and I was like, I'll do it. But what did I do like every great creative? Um, I procrastinated. So, <laughs> and I'm not gonna say how long it took me to do it, but I wrote my story um, and I got it into this presentation. So when I was working, it made me think, how did I get here? Um, the more I dug into, you know, exploring my journey as a writer, I thought, you know, um, or a thought began to congeal more into like a revelation of sorts, but it's actually now becoming a, ph a philosophy that I'm adopting. And that is that, you know, language is a form of design. Words are an element or a tool of design. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the art and science of typography as Katia teaches, um, but there's also something very methodical and technical about the art and science of writing. So syntax, diction, dialect, point of view, perspective, intention. Um, also seems to like coincide with the seven elements of design, but we'll get more into that later. Um, I like to think that I use words to reveal purpose, cultivate impact, and also design structures and safe spaces of advocacy, healing, expression, community, and joy. Um, so language arts, um, I think, like to think I'm reclaiming a really fucking ugly word that we all knew in grade school grammar, um, but I'm trying to make it as cool as possible, so I like to call myself a language artist. But what's my story? So, first things first, words house. Um, and what I mean by this, with words you can really design a foundation. These are your core values, your principle, your why. This is your framework, your infrastructure, and really just your, a sense of your home base. So my first connection to words were through my mother's tongue and my father's ear. It was when I was young that I first realized the power of words. I got lost in them through music, through art, through books. And the poetry of blooming into my identity came to me through my father's music collection first and foremost. Just hearing stories of becoming, of anger, of freedom, sensuality, I hung on to each of them and I started to design my own sense of who I was through words. You know, um, I actually had Vibe Magazine hung on my walls and that was where editorial print became my introduction to typography and published word as design. My first art form was um, actually running away to draw myself closer, going inward. So illustrations of words that I later learned was called calligraphy helped me to process the emotions that I was feeling. It was a form of escape. And words also brought me to Philadelphia for my first internship um, at the age of 15 with the University of Pennsylvania. So shout out to Miss Nadina and my uncle Ezekiel if you're watching online. <laughs> it was there that I actually learned how to um, use words that um, and also see that how they've been used to design institutions of thought, of policy, and of practice. And you know, like any young kid, when the words of others hurt me, I turn to books to replace them. This is a picture of my little sister and me. Um, and I just started to really devour each letter like sugar. I turned to journals to pull at the flowers that were caught in my throat. And I really started to feel seen in the margins of books. And so it was here that I began to realize the power of holding the pen as a mirror and that words create foundation, a base of intention, and a home. Second, fast forward, words carry. Um, I moved across the country to uh, New York where language was all around me. I learned about dialect, 
patois, what is called broken English, and the sounds and words of, of various cultures. Uh, New York really gave me permission to find my own voice. I stuttered, um, studied underground at St. John's University. I didn't want to put their logo because it's ugly, uh, where I shifted my major from journalism to communications. Uh, there I studied marketing and branding, but I started my journalism career at Vibe Magazine. So um, when I was working there, it was actually the uh, beginning of the shift from paper to dot com, where you know things became gossip columns and it was really clickbait porn. Um, words were being utilized to like grab attention spans, but not really create connections. So I quickly became disenchanted with that and moved back to California, where words carried me through some of the toughest moments of my life. I got fired from my first big girl job out of college. I'm not trying to scare any of you if this is like <laughs> your um, undergrad. Um, so I created my own blog. It was called Drinking the Sun, and I began writing to heal from uh, an abusive relationship and just figuring stuff out. Uh, drinking the sun, as illustrative as the word sound, was just that for me. It was to devour the positive, digest the light until you become it. It became a saving grace for me to write and heal. I spoke in third person as if I was writing a manual, you know, from my future self or my highest self to my present self. And it was the first step in me understanding that I could design a curriculum of healing through words. So from there, I expanded my network on social media, started to dive deeper into the world of marketing and branding. The more I wrote, the more I designed my own like microverse on the internet. Um, it sounds really self-serving, but you know, it's the world we live in. Uh, I started to design my own niche and I built a following. So during my time uh, post-grad, I became an autodidact, which is actually one of my favorite words. It really just means you're a writer with seven different jobs. And it taught my, I taught myself the ins and outs of branding, website design, copywriting, and social media management. Um, I saved up money, bought my first car, it was a Honda, and I moved to LA where I slept on my friend's floor for months, shout out to Jamon, uh, working as a freelance writer until I got my first job as a marketing manager at the number one e-commerce brand in the world. I'm gonna skip this very quickly. Um, <laughs> next, words bond. So through words, you can design experience, whether it's for yourself or for a community. So I learned a lot my, about myself at that job and I quickly became to realize that my values and goals were not really lining up with the role that I was in. Uh, so from there I had a heart posture shift and I quit my job. I had no savings, nothing lined up, just confirmation of angel numbers on an EBT card. And I just wanted to show it because I thought it was great design, not really. Um, I decided that the work I was gonna do from here on out was always going to align with my values. It was going to align with my passions for words and community. And it was in this moment that I began to use words as a vessel for designing the life that I desired, designing my life as a love letter. So words really connected me with some of the amazing people that I have in my life today. Uh, through my writing, I began to connect with some of the most talented community-driven leaders in Los Angeles. And this is where I began to write manifestos, brand identities, brand architecture, concepts, and I helped shape the voice of a lot of entities that were focused on this intersection of creativity and purpose. So um, this picture here was actually the first time I had my words on national TV. It was um, a show called Good Trouble um, on HBO, I think. Don't shoot me, I don't know. But it just was so interesting to see language in the form of like um, uh, a set or just like art direction uh, showing up in this way. Um, here is some, uh, I worked with um, Miller's Room in Los Angeles, shout out to my best friend Marquise, um, and also um, Originals Nation and Made with Black Culture you know, just helping them shape their voice as well. Um, so the lyrics, if I told you a flower could bloom in a, bar a dark room, would you trust it? Really planted a seed in my mind. So during this time, I started my own company called Night Flower, where I use words as a vessel for post-traumatic healing centering black and brown women. Um, I was still extremely broke, so I was working as a cocktail server and a writer also for the longest standing black owned newspaper in Los Angeles. And it was through the newspaper that I met my business partner and we founded a virtual co-working social network platform. I designed the brand identity there as well. It was very corporate chic, no pictures are necessary, so I'm just gonna skip through that as well. 
But, you know, words bound me to people that took me my life in further direction. And words began to form the truth and belief that I could really design meaningful spaces, relationships, and ideas that helped other all through the power of language. Next, words harvest. Um, so I have a belief that with the reclamation of words, you can design new futures. Um, there are many words that we can all think of that, you know, through an oppressive lens, the word became a weapon. It became ugly. It became a source of shame. And if you look up the meaning of reclamation, it says, the attempt to make land suitable for building or farming. The treatment of waste materials to get useful materials from them. It's the act of returning something to a better state. So reclamation, restructuring the context, cultivating a new meaning, this really gives form to understanding. It gives you your power back. Through language reclamation, you can design spaces of refuge and courage and of ownership. You regenerate. You reimagine and reestablish a design that serves rather than oppresses. So during this part of my journey, COVID hit, the panini, the panorama, whatever we all called it. I moved to Arizona and I started to kind of fall out of love with words. I started my MSW program with USC that I'm still in, and I quickly learned how words can be used um, as a form of design to oppress, deceive, marginalize, and ostracize. And at the same time, I also began to understand how language is also a means for a revolution, how returning to words can be a catalyst for internal and collective shifts. So as I was in school part-time, it was here I got my first contracting job with Nike to be a senior brand manager of a project at Nike Valiant Labs. And here I learned the power of words as it pertained to reclamation. So communities that I was advocating for and representing with my work taught me that words shape and form the way that we show up in the world. So for me, this experience illuminated a few things from a micro and a macro lens, um, or to say from a personal standpoint and also coming from a brand. The stories that we tell ourselves therefore plant seeds for others all, and they all start with language. How do we utilize that language? What do we reclaim for ourselves? And what do we allow to represent us? So during my time as a senior brand manager for JOIN, the project that we were working on, language was the foundation of all. How we spoke to one another internally, how language framed the way that others received and understood us, understood the brand, the company, and just people in general. Language is the driving force of connection. It's enigmatic, it's all encompassing, and it's universal. So during this time, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start another company. <laughs> and I created Mauve Matter Studio. It's an ideation and conceptuali conceptualization studio where the philosophy is inside out by design. I'm using language and words to build the infrastructure and identity for mission-driven brands or specific projects. I like to think of the work that I'm doing in branding as making the land suitable for farming. Design and language, or language as design, both make people see, feel, experience, listen, react. I really think the reclamation of language and how we intentionally use it as a means for service is how we design for change and plant seeds for the next generation. So next, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and words are healing. So with words, now I'm designing curriculums and new thought. This is just a passion project, but it's, spec it's called Speco System, and it's, sh it's a, an amalgamation of words, meaning slow-paced ecosystem. Um, started during the pandemic, and I just started to ask questions around how do we design a new future? Um, it made me look at the world slowing down. It made me look at the virus as the medicine. It just made me ask questions about like, how do we create solutions for the next generation? Um, I can give you guys more information on this later. And lastly, words reveal. So today I like to think of myself as a global creative. Uh oh, I think something's wrong with the... Let's see if it plays. Or not, let's see, okay. Sorry y'all, so today I'm a global creative. Um, and saying that sometimes carries a weight of like being self-serving, but my words are now being seen on a global scale. So at Nike with words, I like to say I design stories. I design points of view, and I design a lens for others to look at the world. 
I'm a brand narrative manager at Nike, and narrative writing has been an exercising and designing statements that make people act, think, and change course of action all through a lens of sport and movement. And I've been granted the opportunity to use words to narrate, concept, and bring a point of view to creative direction that also creates a world of purpose. So I wanted to show you guys some um, work that I've done with Nike, uh, some worlds that I've designed through words. Okay, it's playing. Thank you. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Okay, cool. So back to the <laughs> regular scheduled programming. Okay, so here are a few um, worlds that I've designed with words at Nike. So the first is um, Future Movement Broadcast. And um, it's a purposeful conversational series with athletes and cultural catalysts. Um, it's really great. We discuss race, inclusion, and really just moving towards the future. So I'm going to play a trailer um, for you guys. It's also on YouTube if you want to check it out. I identify as trans. I go by he, him. My pronouns are she, her. What does it mean to belong in sport? There's a bigger narrative going on, but unfortunately, the most vulnerable of the populations is being picked on, and that's youth. People don't see transness as the invitation that it is. Transmitting from the future. What does a future of belonging look like? On this episode, we explore what it takes to change the future of sport for trans and non-binary athletes. I'm your host, Jenea FutureCon. I'm really excited about this one. Canadian soccer player Quinn is going to share with us their personal experience of being the first openly trans Olympian. We're going around the world to talk to organizations that are doing impactful work in the queer and trans community. You are tuned into FM Broadcast, elevating global voices on the future of sport and culture. I just love it so much. It makes me so happy. Um, yeah, so we did work on that. Um, I helped with the narrative and the writing for um, all episodes for season two. So if you want to check it out, it's very near and dear to my heart. The second one is um, we have a um, community called Be True at Nike, which is our LGBTQIA2 spirit community. Um, and I worked on the global campaign for uh, the summer collection. And this is actually a picture that was in Thailand. And so I'm just like very proud of the messaging. Um, as somebody that's part of the community, it's very near and dear to my heart. But again, just using words to design a world where people feel included and like they belong. Um. <laughs> There is no one way to define us. We are multidimensional. We're breaking generational expectations, doing things our parents could have never imagined. Yet everything they expected us to do. Thank you. Society tells us to do as we're told. Put family first and ourselves last. But we're choosing how to live our lives and when and how we attach ourselves to sports. We show up for family, community, sports, and ourselves. Dale, mija. We are familia. Um, so that's some work that I helped my friend Chris um, for Latina Heritage Month, uh, where I acted as a creative director consultant and helped to craft the language and the concept for this year. Uh, so Dale Mija is a phrase that we reclaimed as an exclamation of support as we um, elevated Gen Z Latina athletes. Um, this is some work that we did with uh, Naomi Osaka. So. Um, the language is actually not on here, but um, what we know of Naomi Osaka to design, um, and we, we wanted to design a world for her uh, that inspired others to show up as their authentic selves through expression and movement. So this is the work that we did, um, I think this past October, for her collection under Discover Your Aura. So there's much more work to come with um, Nike. Um, this is also work that I did with um, Nike Virtual Studios that's more in the Web3 space. So it's actually their home for Nike Virtual Creations, and I help craft the language and the voice of um, 
their platform as well. So it's really fun. This is just like a scroll through that we can look through. Um, yeah. So like I said, I just like to think of myself as a language artist using words to design and facilitate healing, action, and spaces of joy. Um, words can really illustrate, illu sorry, words can illustrate new understandings of design. So they really shape our reality. They color the space between us all. They house and create space for refuge. They form the esoteric into mutuality and understanding. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, they give name to feelings and bridge the past to the future. They draw lines to preserve, protect, and connect. They illuminate common values that we all hold. And they texturize the moments where laughter, silence, and a smile need accompaniment to feel whole. So um, I encourage you all to just examine and take inventory of your life as you begin your own journeys of designing your life and taking the next step in your career. What words are you using to craft your narrative, your internal compass, your philosophies, and, the, and to design the spaces that you inhabit? What words are you surrounding yourself with and telling yourself as tools in your arsenal? And how can you use, it, use the power of specificity, creativity, and vision to design your own love letter to yourself and to the communities that you care about. Thank you so much. So we'll open it up to questions, and I have the power of this microphone to give you if anyone here wants love to ask mic. questions. I know you all have questions. <laughs> uh, hello, thank you very much for a very I uh, love your engaging. Glasses. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I love yours too. <laughs> we should exchange. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm really sold into the word aspect of your presentation. Um, how do you put that into teaching design and one? And then the other question that I have is there's, I love, I love what you said at first, says uh, words house, mm. but that house also becomes sort of a jail. Mm. <clears throat> and I mean, there's certain spectrum you can use. You can say community in one way, maybe two, three times or four or five different ways, but then mm. that's it. Mm -hmm. So, th w what challenges do you find in, in language as constraining as opposed mm -hmm. to expanding? Oh, that's a good one. So, I'll answer your first question. I'm a little confused. You're saying, how do I teach language as design? Is that what you're asking? How do you incorporate beyond typography? Because typography mm -hmm. is pretty obvious, but mm -hmm. content, how, mm -hmm. do you, how, do you how do you envision teaching the importance of words mm. in design uh, processes? Mm. I like to think when you look at language, it's something that is, um, it's omnipresent, right? So we use language on a daily basis. Um, I always like to just say interrogate the words that are around you and see how they're affecting the way you show up, affecting your work. Um, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but I think just questioning the language that you're surrounding yourself with. And then the second question was, I'm sorry. I don't remember <laughs> either. <laughs> oh, you said words can be a jail? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the constraint of language. Mm, that's a great question. That is a great question. I'm going to think about that because I don't know the answer. And I'll find some language to answer the question <laughs> later, later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello, hello. Hi. This was such a beautiful um, presentation and so Thank inspiring, just, just visually and just, you know, the space of just having, figuring out your trajectory as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that kind of popped out to me, or even just congratulations overall, because it's just great to even see a Thank creative you. that is doing what they want <laughs> <laughs> under their own terms. Mm. Um, I guess my question to you is like, 
have you found it challenging to be placed in the box? Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing I love about the space of like taking time to brand yourself, mm -hmm. which is where I am at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but at the same time, people constantly telling you who you are yeah. and having to reintroduce yourself constantly, constantly. Yes. Um, I think you, your last statement was the global. I think we had techno technical difficulties <laughs> when it was happening, but mm -hmm. you said you were global. Um, I think I just said a global creative. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess that question would be is how, what kind of feedback have you gotten? Is there confusion? Do people mm. feel like they don't know? And how do you redirect it and also take ownership for that? Mm. I love this question because this is something that I've struggled with for a long time. <laughs> like when I was, um, writing like right after college and just trying to figure it out you know everyone just kept putting me in the box of being a writer and I'm like but I'm a creative like I'm a polymath I do multiple things but I found that like I would always return to words somehow um and like using language to like just talk about my perspective and as like a creative director or just like a creative consultant you know it always returned to words um but I think that I try not to put myself in a box. Like I look at words as a tool um, and words just kind of as a home base, right? And through words and through language and exploring different meanings of things um, and interrogating what they mean to me and how they apply to my life, I'm able to just kind of go into different like creative avenues, if that makes sense. So with words like I learned that like creative direction is it, like you have to have words to express creativity, right? Um, and I think like the more that you educate yourself, that you just like ask questions, like you're passionately curious, that is how you get into different like creative avenues, right? Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's just, I guess, cause I come from a visual space and mm. mine is from fashion design and most of my career has been working for labels that don't necessarily align with my mm -hmm. the value aspect and also aesthetically and all those different yeah. things. Um, but when you can create, you can create, yes. you know? So you live and breathe creation. And mm -hmm. also it's just like, how do you complain about being able to <laughs> make money off of that? But at the same time, like really, really understanding what your voice is and mm -hmm. how that shows up for you. Yeah. But also constantly making sure you reintroduce yourself and make sure you stay Absolutely. true to that. Mm -hmm. So that's what, I think you kind of answered that question, but I, I'm always curious how people navigate that world. Mm. It's really hard, it's really hard. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. That's something that I still like, I don't wanna say struggle with, cause that's a strong word, but something that I question on a day-to-day -day basis is like how people perceive me as a creative, like how do I show up? Mm -hmm. um, and I think like as creative people, it's just always a work in progress, you know? Um, one thing that my best friend taught me is like you teach others how to teach you, I mean, um, perceive you. Um, and so, I don't know, I guess I just try to do my best work and put it out there, you know? That's great. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, good. So this question is from Ariana, and she wants to know how the healing power of words works for you. Mm -hmm. um, her question is, how do you heal yourself with words with the slowdown uh, company or the brief new passion project that you have mentioned? Oh, uh, Speco system? Yes. Um, yeah, so I think for me, um, healing through words is just like my practice. Um, Every month I like, I'm really big, I'm gonna sound woohoo for a second, but I like to meditate. And so I think every month at the beginning, I just like to sit and s feel what I wanna call in for the month. And it's always a word that pops up, like power or res restoration or just really being in tune with yourself. And I use those words to kind of craft and design like what I do for that month. Um, I think also writing, as a form of healing, like journaling has really helped me. Just stream of consciousness, putting it on paper and not trying to be perfect. What is coming up? 
what can you write out? And just being able to have that as like an archival system of where you've been and where you want to go also helps. It's like a point of reference. Um, and then for Speco system, I'm really like using um, the academic uh, knowledge that I have around social work and social futures um, and just using language to ask more questions. Like, how can we um, <laughs> limit pollution? Um, how can we um, create more spaces of belonging? How do we get into policy? Um, what does facilitating in communities look like? These are all questions that I ask myself. Um, and I just write about them. And yeah, I think it's just going back to like essays as an art form. Um, I hope that answers her question. But yeah, I just, I just write. Got one more here. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you like to collaborate with other people? I, I think um, for all of us, well, I don't want to speak for everybody, but for a lot of us, like we're kind of an introverted crew sometimes. And I yes. think um, of writing as being very much that, like yeah. when I write, I need time to reflect and mm -hmm. consider. Mm -hmm. um, how do you collaborate best? What helps you show up the way you want to in working with other people? Oh, I love this question. Um, so I actually didn't start to master the art of collaboration until I started working at Nike um, because I used to work in a silo. Like I'm very much an independent worker. I like to have my space. Um, I like to be a recluse. And um, I used to just think that isolation was the best for me. Um, and when I started working at Nike, just like being able to have conversations with other creative people is such a privilege because there is so much, like just dialogue, you know? Um, that really helps my writing, just hearing different points of view, um, being curious about other people's perspectives, taking what I can, like knowledge that I can get from other people and using that in my craft. Um, and like what I need to be able to show up is I need to, affirm myself first and foremost. I think like as a writer, um, and this kind of goes back to your question, like I've dealt with imposter syndrome for a long time. And so being able to affirm myself and just speak my point of view in collaboration really helps me as a writer. Um, because I used to think like writing wasn't artistic or you know, writing wasn't, it's not like a visual form of art. It's not like fine art, right? But, um, well, technically it can be. But yeah, I think that really helps me showing up is affirming myself um, and just having conversations. Did I answer your question, Kristen? Totally. I think that's, well, as a designer, that's really relatable, especially mm -hmm. the part about like imposter syndrome and at least to me, mm -hmm. like not feeling like it's a fine art. Mm. And then you're like, what kind of <laughs> bullshit am I internalizing right. with that? You know, because you define what that is. Absolutely. So. That's great. Thank you. No, thank you. Oh, Lord. This is my friend Jelana, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> All the better to ask questions. I just feel like it's a good follow-up question on that. So as creatives, mm -hmm. um, we're normally passionate people and are sensitive about our work. Mm -hmm. And so in the workspace or corporate, have mm -hmm. you ever experienced, um, you know, a time where maybe coworkers didn't like your narrative direction? And if so, <laughs> how do you um, handle that critique? Yes. And not let it like, you know, get the best of you. Handle the critique. Mm. So to quote the great auntie Erica Badu, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit, okay? But um, I, this is also really funny. It's something that I am dealing with. My director, shout out to Zerna, I don't know if she's watching, but uh, one of her main pieces of feedback for me like during my development and the career that I'm in now is don't take everything so personally. And for me, that's really hard because when you're an artist, you're creating from your soul, your heart, everything, your experience. And 
I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. Don't take anything personally when, you know, when it comes to your art. Maybe take it personally, but don't internalize it or use, like, learn how to work with the critique, um, make partnership with it. But I would say definitely take it personally. Um, that's just me. But um, I think, like, when in those moments uh, <laughs> when people come back with critique about my work, and if it's like narrative writing or just an idea in general, um, I'm learning to interrogate. I think that's like the main thing is like interrogate why. Um, something that also like helps me is understanding that rejection is a redirection and no is the opening of a conversation. So I really try to take that into um, spaces where you're collaborating with people and different opinions are flying but um, just always ask why, open up the conversation, see if there's something there that you all can like, you know, create a Venn diagram and like come to the middle. And if not, like, how can you take that away as like um, just more like tools in your arsenal for yourself? But yeah, it's really hard because I take everything personal. <laughs> but yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. So the question was, is there, was there ever a time that I believed in my work and, like pushed and pushed back? Like you really just oh, girl, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah, no, I'm, pu I'm a pusher, Katie. I'm a pusher. But um, no, I definitely push back a lot. Um, I think me pushing back, though, with my words is just asking questions. Um, learning how to say, have you thought about this? Or why do you feel that way? Or have you looked at it from this perspective? What do you think about this? Um, have really helped me. But I would always say advocate for yourself, especially in spaces um, where you're putting yourself out there in a way where you're just so connected to your creations. You know, advocate for yourself. Um, yeah, great question. <laughs> Hello, Hi. so uh, my name is Silver, and I am um, black and trans, and I also studied graphic design, but I'm also a painter and visual artist, mm. um, to say the least. Love. <laughs> um, I currently have a job doing communications and brand strategy related mm. uh, work, but it's for a nonprofit organization. Mm, okay. And I'm someone who, due to institutional racism, like I was able to, after completing four years of undergrad, mm -hmm. I actually didn't graduate. Mm. And so um, I still have like that outstanding, mm -hmm. those outstanding credits and so on and so forth kind of mm -hmm. hanging over my head. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I have found it easier as a designer mm -hmm. to get jobs in the nonprofit realm mm -hmm. than with like agencies, for example, or with, um, or like in any kind of like corporate fashion. Mm. Um, and that actually works for me, but I do have a question about like, for someone like myself who is so talented <laughs> and right, I mm. mean, come on. <laughs> we have to, we have to, it's important to, um, to just be unapologetic sometimes, yes. especially mm -hmm. when we're up against the wall constantly in our yeah. education and like, we know how important education is, as mm -hmm. you, you stated yourself, like continue to ask questions, educate yourself. And when you're in the process of doing that, mm -hmm. but you're being told like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> not because you're doing anything wrong, but because of like who you are, mm -hmm. it does make you feel unapologetic about yeah. your badassery. Yeah. So just to put that out there. So the question is um, beyond like it being a trend mm -hmm. to celebrate diversity, mm -hmm. beyond it being a trend to like, oh my God, black trans lives matter, black trans people, let's put them on this poster and mm. like whatever, make mm. these videos. Is Nike, for example, or other institutions, um, companies like Nike, but whatever your experience is, like is, are these kinds of, are they creating spaces to hire mm. people who 
people like myself, Mm -hmm. people who maybe have the portfolio but don't have that stamp of Mm -hmm. the degree Mm -hmm. and your experience. Like, as the world is changing, are you starting to see that a portfolio is more valuable Mm -hmm. or is it still pretty tough to get in? Mm. Great question, Silver. Um, I will speak from my personal experience and not from the Nike experience, because I can't speak on that legally. But in my personal experience, um, yes. I will say that the people that I have been around are very, are advocates. um, And that's something very intentional. I will say that my director that I work with directly is very intentional about making sure, I'm gonna just tell y'all this. My team that I work with is the most diverse team that I've seen at so-and-so corporation and I'm very grateful to say that it's because my director is very intentional about who we hire looking at the work versus the qualifications and I say that in big air quotes what is your point of view and how do you show up you know how do you add to the conversation Um, what's your personality like do you have good politics you know are you a kind person I think I've been blessed to experience um a culture at my job and who I work with where those things are more important than seeing where you graduated from. Um, And so I'm also open to talking with you, Silver, about opportunities, because I would love to see your badassery and help you how I can. So um, yeah. Cheers to that. Cheers. Thank you. (laughs) Anyone else, questions? I gotta remember it just a second. I know you look like you're very pensive over there. I had it. (laughs) Uh, So the Web three stuff. What's that? um, Seemed like super crazy, and then I had seen that uh, dot swoosh thing come out, Mm -hmm. and I like totally got it. I understood how it could be like businesses or or organizations could use it. Um. So for you to to write all of that is like I didn't get it I read one thing and then I did beyond just like what one organ like it was just about what Nike was going to do but I saw how it could be implemented like in so many other ways what was the like research behind all of that for like is it uh, yeah it's just like seriously like what's up with the research about it because I (laughs) don't it must it seems like so wild to have all that thought and then streamline into like the finite amount of words that you used mm. and totally understood it yeah from the like cr- out outer aspect of it being like a new technology to like now y- mm. y'all are like really uh at the forefront of like using that technology mm-hmm. I, it's just I'm, I'm so interested about like the research behind yeah. all of that so if you maybe just shine some light on like the research about aspects of it yeah for sure Curious. um so for that i'm not on the nike virtual studios team i was actually asked to come in and craft some language with them um but they also asked me like if i had knowledge about the web3 space and all that and since the pandemic hit the panini or whatever um i was doing like my own my own research essentially and so it was just kind of right up my alley. I was like, oh, this is great. I had told my director, I was like, I really want to work with them. And they reached out. So to answer your question about like the process of research and how to condense the language, um, for me, so a few things. The Web3 space is really, um, it can be intimidating, you know, because there's so many, there's a lot of jargon that people use. And I feel like language, and to your answer your question, language can be a constraint because other people, it, it is used as a way to keep people out. And so um, what I wanted to do when I was working with them is use language that is like for every person, right? Like very colloquial, easy to understand. Um, and I say that lightly but just using language that is very conversational. And so that was more so of the process is like, if we're talking about accessibility, which you will read on the website, um, their mission is to make Web3 or virtual creations accessible for the everyday person, especially for the marginalized communities. 
And so I was like, you know what? Then the language has to be like, you know, we're just talking to the homies or something like that. Um, so I think, I don't want to say condensing, but um, maybe structuring these ideas in a way where you're just getting very conversational and you're being very empathetic, I think is um, how I, what the process was for me. But I had already had like a lot of research done on my end and then I guess it was just like luck that I got asked to do this work and I um, hope that answers your question. Cool. Um, my question is like, how does your process differ when you're working on like a larger project for Nike versus your more personal like oh my God. ethos and like how you work through that and like your own voice in both of them? Lord, um, my th I like to stay as authentic as possible. I have never been somebody that has minced my words. And so I like to show up at work the same way. Um, of course, like I can't say things that would take me to the HR office or whatever, but I like to just be as authentic as possible when it comes to process. Oh my God. Um, I think at work, you know, I'm under deadlines, right? Um, I'm also neurodivergent. I have ADHD. So I think the deadlines at work help me to, I guess, just get my shit together because I'm like, my livelihood is on the line. I need to do good at work. I need my bills paid. So, and I also just want to do great work. So I think that helps me to show up faster um, and just, um, yeah. And then personally, girl, it's a mess. Um, it's all over the place. I think, you know, for me, passion projects are exactly that passion projects and I like to treat them as such and you know just this concept of slowness um, for me slowness is a love language and slowness is how I show up for my passion projects just taking my time learning that all I all I that I can research as much as I can and just like really trying to inject joy into it when it's not fun anymore I don't want to do it um, and so yeah I think the the difference between my two processes at work is, um, you know, work is structured and there's more on the line, there's more opportunity cost. And for me, it's, I really just try to keep it fun. Um, how long, however long that takes. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got time for a few more. I saw one over here, and then let's start with the chat, and then we'll take one more from the room. This question is from Jaman. <laughs> okay. What are three Hi, words <laughs> that you are using currently as tools to design the future? What are three words mm -hmm. to design the future? Mm -hmm. I was going to say run me my money, but that's four words. Mm -hmm. um, three words to design the future. Ooh. Dang, why are y'all putting me on the spot like that? Ooh. I think reclamation is something that's coming up a lot for me, just like the act of reclaiming things. Um, I would say the second is, ooh. Illuminate. Um, it's funny, uh, something that I struggle with is being in the spotlight. And I think there is a very um, paradoxical relationship between me and that word. So illuminating my work um, as I put myself out there more. Um, and then the third one, oh, we said change the future or my future. Lord. Design the future. Design the future. Damn, okay. And then the third one would be abolition or, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, the third one would be, oh, that's great. I think purpose. Yeah, I'm just gonna say purpose. I'm gonna keep it very like, you know, woo-hoo, purpose. Thank you, Jamon, for making me think in front of all these people. We got one more cool. online, and then we'll take one more from the room here. 
Um, how have other people's writing served as a barrier for you? Mm. And how did you push through, like push past those words to rewrite your narrative? That is a great question. Also, Jam Jamon. Okay. Get off the computer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, how have other people's words been? Uh, oh, my God. Um, I think, so it's so funny. So I'm just going to take you guys through a story because I love context. So last month, um, I did No Lyrics November. So I just listened to jazz, to like binaural beats, lo-fi, all these things. And I just feel like sometimes when I do read other people's work or listen to other people's voice way too much, I just feel constipated. I feel congested. I just feel too full of other people's like words. And so um, I was like, let me just release so I can hear myself. I feel like I wasn't hearing myself for a while. And um, yeah, I think like sometimes this journey as a creative, not sometimes, all of it is trusting your intuition, is like knowing what your own voice is and showing up in that way. And so sometimes when we, you know, ingest or digest other people's work too much, it can be a barrier, it can be a block. So um, when it gets to that point, I like to just take silence as a practice and really just focus in on how am I feeling, like interrogating like what I like, um, yeah, I think silence for sure. Thanks, Jermon. All right, I saw one more over here. Um, where do you look for for inspiration for like language? So like, like the Pinterest version of language. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really love Arena, 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 something like that. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, would still love a brand deal with them, but don't know how to pronounce it. I use that. I would say that's like the Pinterest of language right now. Um, cause I love how you can craft stories with different quotes and things like that. Um, also conversations with my friends or just conversations with strangers. I've always found that I've learned something, um, through different people, new people, um, conversations with elders for sure. There's a lot of wisdom there that I like to take um, and use. And then books. I just love reading. I'm a bookworm, so yeah. I'll ask one more to close it down okay. here. Um, if you had advice for your like former self, Ooh. Like one piece of advice. Y'all are taking me to church today. What is happening? I love this question because you can answer it a million ways and always be right. Um, what would that piece of advice be? Oh. Mm, to my past self or a younger self. Mm. I think it's something my dad told me like a few months ago and I, I've been carrying it with me. He He said... Um, don't shame yourself for being original. And I think he really meant to say is like, you know, don't shy away from yourself and who you are and your authenticity because there's space for that in the world somewhere. Um, and just hone in on that. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably what it was. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all.